Okay. Um, <clears throat> thank you for um, inviting me to speak today, Tina. Um, I'm Adrian McEwen, and I'm not an archaeologist, I'm afraid. Uh, I'm a <clears throat> technologist, I guess is probably the best term, easiest term. Um, and so I do lots of digital stuff. Um, and usually when we think of digital, it's all about, you know, apps. Like, there's an app for that, and it's all about pouring more and more of your kind of life into little tiny glowing rectangles. Um, and, you know, they're not happy with them being right down in front of you, they're supposed to be strapped to your face. Um, <clears throat> and yeah, I mean, th that stuff's all cool and I do use it. As the screen, there's one in my pocket, there's one here, there's lots of screens around. Um, the sort of stuff that I work with, I'm more interested in how we get, instead of pouring more of life to the glowing rectangles, it's kind of getting the tech and putting the tech into the real world uh, where the rest of us are. Um, and so, so that kind of, I suppose, what led me into working with uh, George Oates um, and Tom Flynn, who are the other co-founders of Museum in a Box. Uh, these days, it's just me, unfortunately. But uh, uh, yeah, so I'm just going to talk a bit about what Museum in a Box is, how some of the kind of techniques and stuff behind it, because I figured that it might be useful to talk about some of the digital stuff uh, that we use. Um, and then, and kind of why, why we might want to do any of this stuff. So first off, what is Museum in a Box? And well, what? This is a video that I put in, wasn't exactly what the text says, but whilst it's playing, I'll more tech, <laughs> show you the real thing. That or and then this is to where people at the back might be able to see the box at the front. So <clears throat> this is a museum in a box. Uh and museum box objects. So place back in there. And if lost or a friend if you like. Yeah, that's, that's the, the main thing. Museum of which you get an object, you put it on. Um, so it doesn't have to be the prints um, of objects that are in the British Museum. Uh, so they're all kind of scale. Um, if I can show you that. Uh, Beetle, um, monumental. Sorry, sorry. Uh, in in the, that's kind of about yay high. Um, do postcards as well. So each of the objects has one of these little stickers on it um, that I can just put up whilst looking over my. Um, which is a RFID or NFT tag. So it's got a little tiny, tiny computer on it. Hell box, uh, which it is. I always like frogs. Frogs. So this is a collection uh, from the Smithsonian. Um, it was a naturalist fifty did field recordings, so you get to hear him uh, talk about these frogs. It would be most tempting to produce some sort of tell as a mating call, with a pit depending largely on the size of the species. Produce quite a variety of sounds. So named because it always sounds like hammering a nail in the cabin is a carpenter frog. It's a sphagnum frog east of the United States. I should have picked the box. Frogs are really cool and different. So whenever we go to shows and things, people always love frogs. Um, so that's yeah, what Museum in a Box is. Uh, 
Let me get back to my slides. Okay, yes. Um, maybe I'll stick with the mic, given that I'm kind of wandering around and being near my computer. Um, <clears throat> so, so, yes, we have a box. There's a physical thing that you get, but then you also get access to our cloud. Um, and that's where you go and build up your own collection of objects. So you kind of create whichever objects you can put into you know, into your collection on the box, uh, upload the audio that you've recorded, for them and then associate it and write it onto the tag. So basically, when people buy a box, you get a box and a reel of NFC stickers. And so you put the stickers onto things and you write them with the box, write the information into them. And then after that, it plays whatever audio you've told it. Uh, and then you can put your collections on. So you know, if you've got more than one box, you can put different collections on different boxes and things like that. Um, and so, so that's kind of the tech. Um, and then, or the kind of main tech. And then I figured I'd talk a little bit about kind of how we get the 3D scans, things like that, and how you might be able to do that sort of thing. Uh, so this is a very expensive, I think, I assume, it looks very expensive, uh, <laughs> um, photogrammetry rig. Um, I know that the archaeology department at Liverpool University have just started playing with one of these. Uh, a kind of computer-controlled camera, so it can move it around. The, object can get placed on the turntable and rotated and it can move up and kind of angle the camera and things so that it can take all of these photos around the object in order to then stitch them all together uh, to build a 3D model of the um, object in the computer. Um, so yeah, that one I think is probably quite big, uh, quite expensive, um, probably reasonably big, like kind of table sort of size. Um, but then wouldn't do buildings and things like that. Would probably struggle with some of the large objects in the British Museum. One of them, uh, we've got the British Museum's built a staircase around it, uh, which was quite good for our photogrammetry because we could just walk up the staircase taking photos all the way around it. Um, things like this 3D scanner. Um, this is, I think, about £8,000. Uh, i played with one of these, but uh, I've seen people using them that. Basically, you kind of wave it around and it knows where it is and it's a laser thing. It's the object and then the software can kind of stitch things together. Uh, usually when we're doing the scanning, uh, it looks like this. Um, so this is uh, Charlie, one of my former colleagues, um, doing some scanning of, of an urn. Uh, so, I mean, it's basically the same as that kind of big expensive rig at the start. We've just got a human moving around. So the com computer doesn't know quite as much where the camera is when it's taking the photo, but if you get enough of them to kind of overlap in the same way that you do sort of panoramic photos, um, it, it basically stitches them together um, in the software afterwards. And so we take loads and loads of photos and then you use some software to process it. Um, this is the software that we tend to use. It's about 200 quid. There's a 30 day trial if you ever wanted to play around with it. Um, and, and yeah, that works very nicely. We've used to make those the three D models for those uh, prints that I have on there. Um, there's also Alice Vision Mesh Room, which I haven't played with yet. It's open source, and so it's freely available. Um, so that could be quite good. I'm sort of like starting with the really expensive, then going to the. Oh, these are the more expensive, more more affordable, like the ones I'm more likely to play with. Um, and you can also phone. I haven't used the, this is Polycam, the software that is a screenshot of the uh, their website in the background. Um, but yeah, often like my ancient Sony Android phone came with a little photogrammetry app built into it, um, which you can then just take loads of photos and then export a 3D model into the computer uh, and do, you know, kind of computery stuff with them in the screen. But you can also then print them. So again, kind of starting at the more expensive end of things, there are services like Shapeways and iMaterialize, uh, where you upload your model um, and then pay them some money. They have a whole load of different types of 3D printers and some really fancy, expensive 3D printers. 
uh, and they will print out your object and post it to you. So you, just, you know, you don't need a 3D printer. You can just upload it onto the internet, pay some money, get a 3D print back. Um, or 3D printers these days are getting to be kind of, you know, pretty affordable. Um, the end of the model started a couple of hundred quid. Um, the bamboo is getting a lot of traction at the moment. Lots of people are using those. They seem quite nice. Um, this is an Ultimaker 2. It's actually quite an old printer now, but uh, that's what these objects here were printed on. And basically, it's a, it's a controlled hot glue gun. Um, so you feed plastic into it. It gets heated up to a couple of hundred degrees, squirted out of a little tiny thin 4 mil nozzle, and the computer moves it around, draws one layer, moves up a little bit, draws the next layer, moves up a little bit, draws the next layer, and just keeps doing that until you've got the objects that you've kind of loaded into it. Um, so yeah, these are you know fairly to get myself. Um, the other one would be to go and talk to you know local universities. Um, there are quite a few of the partners do that sort of thing where they, they kind of work with local university to do the scanning as well as the printing. Um, or go and find your local hack space or maker space. So there are loads of those across the country. Most of the big cities some kind of a hack space, which is basically just lots of geeks getting together to kind of play with tech. Um, I am, yeah, co-founder and, and work out of uh, one in Liverpool called Does Liverpool. Um, so yeah, we have laser cutters and 3D printers and CNC machines and CNC embroidery machines and digital knitting machines and soldering irons and yeah, anyway, that's a completely different talk. I won't, <clears throat> won't diverge into that one. Um, but you know, these sorts of things are accessible. And it often makes sense to go and chat to those sorts of people anyway. Because um, there are lots of things that can go wrong when you get your 3D printer. Like, none of them are terrible, but there are definitely times when you kind of set print going and then you come back and there's just this massive kind of plastic spaghetti because uh, the print kind of failed a bit. Um, and, you know, don't worry about it. It happens to all of us. Um, <laughs> but it's just one of the things that sometimes happens with. And so why would you want to do all of these sorts of things? Um, so I, I thought... I'd pull out a couple of examples of what some of the um, uh, people we've, we've worked with um, have done with museums in boxes. Um, so the Royal Mint Museum have 75 boxes, I think, uh, something around that kind of number. Uh, and they were doing a project for 50 years since decimalization. And basically they built up these collections of cards and, and objects around, you know, kind of little money purse with old coins in, um, and, and then the audio. And actually, um, one of the things that the last talk just reminded me of is that we've got, we can kind of do multilingual because we can put two stickers on to the postcards. So they have a Welsh version and an English version in, in there because the museum is based in Wales. But they send these boxes out homes across the country. In the UK, um, you get in touch with the Royal Museum and ask for a box, and they'll post the box out, and then they kind of remembering sessions with the residents, um, and, and work through and, and do stuff like that. And when they're done with it, they can post it back to the Royal Mint, and they send it to somebody else. And so they've got this nice map of the places they've sent boxes, which is just awesome. Like they they went, yeah, probably about six months ago now, across a thousand kind of boxes sent out to care homes around around the country, uh, which is really cool. Um, and then good, it's all content, so with all the work. Uh, this was a project that Dr. Gibson worked on uh, with the collective, a Zulu collective in South Africa, and she was looking at, or they as a group, were looking at kind of decolonizing um, the local museum in South Africa, which had collected loads of stuff off the Zulus when the white people had arrived, uh, and made really bad notes about what it was. There's just, uh, this is a spear, we haven't got any notes about what this is, totally look cool, we put it in our, in our archive, uh, or just like... This is a spoon made out of bone. And like that's the entirety of the collection notes from the... I mean, yeah, it was quite a while ago that they were doing this. I suspect 
they do a better job of uh, collecting the object now. Um, but the collective could work with that and, and explore the archives and, and provide much more context about what these different objects were and what they meant to the tribes. Um, and then they, as part of that, made recordings about some of the objects. We had photos of some of the objects and the original notes on the cards, and then the voices the collective um, you know, explain what this was and, and how they used it, which is really nice. And the music over in the brick have just this really nice uh, seeing without sight project. So they worked, they've had museum, we've got a few, I suppose there's three of them there at least. Um, I'm not sure. I have, yeah, they have all museums in boxes and they put them in their museum. Um, and they've just done this project where they took them and then they had a group of visually impaired co creators who came to the museum with them to explore the archives, interesting um, objects, and then it, um, the, objects, the objects were, uh, and then place them in. And they worked with the local university to scan and 3D print the objects that they could put onto it. And then people would come in, pick up the object, just see what it's like, um, and then the description that tells them about, uh, about how it works, how it works what it is, yeah, and describe the object. Um, and then also the additional tactile um, things as well. So there was a, a really nice. Uh, the linen uh, kind of dress. They had a, a sample so you it was like uh, uh, were listening to the audio that told you about the dress. Um, so it's just taking you know, in slightly different ways. Obviously, it's a bit more audio focused generally, so it's a good bit of deaf, I imagine. Um, but you've still got the postcards and and so yeah, it was a really nice. Uh, they, they, they won an award over in Ireland um, for that exhibition. Um, it was really good. It was really nice seeing how yeah, how much engagement they got through that. Um, really, really good. And so that brings me to the end of. And I thought, given that you were all archaeologists, I'd take a photo, I'd include a photo at the end. Kind of archaeology in a box. Uh, just laid out all the different, you know, like early versions and kind of cardboard types to work out what shape it should be and all sorts of things like that. Um, so that seemed like archaeology to, to end on. Thank you. <laughs>